Welcome back to chapter 10, part two. Let's dive into the process of meiosis. So very, very similar to mitosis. <clears throat> meiosis is going to have to first start out by duplicating the chromosomes. In other words, we need to go through an interphase so that we can have an S phase so that we can have sister chromatids. Meiosis is then going to have be very different from mitosis in a lot of ways. For example, meiosis is going to take place in two sets of cell divisions called meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Those are Roman numerals, 1 and 2. The two cell divisions are going to result in four daughter cells rather than the two daughter cells that we saw in mitosis. But, and again, super important, each daughter cell is only going to have half as many chromosomes as the original parent cell. So um, if you are looking at meiosis, if you have one pair of homologous chromosomes, like you see right here, this is just one pair of homologous chromosomes. In a, in a diploid cell, okay, diploid means that you've got both the chromosome from mom and from dad there. Um, both of those have to be duplicated. And these, now this one has a sister chromatid attached to the centromere. This has a sister chromatid attached to the centromere. Okay, great. Um, those sister chromatids are going to be closely associated across their entire length in something called sister chromatid cohesion. And for the most part, oh, just, oh sorry, just remember that the, the homologs have different versions of the gene called alleles. Just kind of remember that, keep that in mind, because that's going to be really important when we think about what's going, the interesting things that are going to happen in meiosis. One of which is that, um, that homologs are not in any other time, in any other way, Homolog, homologous chromosomes aren't associated with each other. They're just like happily flitting around doing their own thing in the nucleus, not anywhere near each other, except during meiosis. During meiosis, we do have homologous chromosomes come together in something called a tetrad. And you can see that word right here, tetrad. So we, we're going to have this weird thing happen where homologous chromosomes are going to be for a very, very brief, brief period of time, they're going to be associated with each other. So here's, here's our overview. Um, the interphase has to happen because we have to make sister chromatids. So this is in like G1, and this is like during G2 because they've already fully formed their sister chromatid. So awesome. We're going to go through meiosis one, and the big thing that's going to happen in meiosis one, I mean, I'm sorry, there are a lot of big things that happen in meiosis one, but the, the big overview thing that's going to happen is that homologous chromosomes are going to separate. If I go back up here to interphase and I count how many chromosomes are in this cell, I got two. One from dad, one from mom. Even when they've replicated, it's still just two chromosomes. One from dad that's replicated and one from mom that's replicated. But if I look at what happens at the end of meiosis one, I only have one chromosome in here. So we are haploid, those cells are haploid at the end of meiosis one. We still have to go through another round of meiosis because sister chromatids have to separate. They were made up here, we gotta separate them. So we do that in meiosis two. Now, if you were to count how many chromosomes are in this cell, it's back to being one, right? One in each of these cells. But don't forget that there's only one chromosome in this cell as well. One here and one here. There's two in each of these. But as soon as meiosis one is done, you're down to having one chromosome in each cell. The first meiotic division, homologous chromosomes separate. In the second meiotic division, sister chromatids separate, and you end up having four haploid cells. Just throwing all our words in there. Let's take a look at the overview, and then we're gonna break it down, looking at each of those meiotic divisions separately, um, and kind of in a, in a stepwise fashion, we're gonna take a look at this. All right, so, <laughs> 
notice that in prophase one, oh, and the names are very similar, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, but um, we don't talk about prometaphase when we're talking about meiosis. It just gets too confusing. So if you remember back when we were talking about um, the process of mitosis, I said sometimes books add in this prometaphase idea, um, but then they always drop it in meiosis. So, so we're not talking about prometaphase anymore. It's just prophase, then metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, all Roman numeral one. Lots and lots of stuff happens in prophase one, and we'll get some good details of that in a second. Uh, metaphase, they're lining up on the metaphase plate, but it happens a little differently in meiosis. In anaphase, we got some stuff separating, but it's happening a little different than it did in mitosis. And then telophase happens. And then we go through the second round of meiosis two, and, um, and we'll hit all of those. But meiosis two is pretty straightforward compared to meiosis one. One other thing I wanted to quickly point out to you, if you might recall when I was talking to you back on the mitosis chapter, chapter nine, I talked about the North and South Pole. And I said, that's kind of arbitrary. Um, this is, you can see that here in meiosis too. They've turned these cells on their sides. That's totally fine. Still North and South Pole. Again, which one is North and which one is South doesn't matter. It's just the idea of having them being on opposite sides of the cell that's important. All right, so let's dive into the wild stuff that is prophase one. Very interesting, so much going on here. Um, it's in prophase one of meiosis one that the chromosomes are doing very similar things that they were doing in mitosis. Like the chromosomes condense, they coil up, right? The nucleus starts to disappear. The microtubules start to form, and the centrosomes with those centrioles inside, they start to separate, right? Um, all of those things happen, and some other stuff happens. For example, we form this thing called the tetrad. That didn't happen in mitosis. When, the, when you have a tetrad, you have the homologous chromosomes lined up side by side, gene by gene. That's the tetrad. And tetra means four. So if you think about what the four means in this, it's actually referring to sister chromatids. So one, two, three, four sister chromatids. Um, and then what happens is that they do this thing called crossing over. So crossing over happens, and I've got a detail of this on the next slide, but where non-sister chromatids, remember I just defined this term for you, non-sister chromatids. Non-sister chromatids exchange bits of information. And so they become mixed chromosomes. Now, um, I'll, I'll get to how this is going to happen in a second, but um, the kinetochore microtubules are still going to connect to the kinetochore. But instead of it happening on either side of the sister chromatid like it did in mitosis, it's actually connecting to different sets of the pair. So we've got one set of kinetochores attached to like maybe this is the north pole over here and the other set connected to the south pole over there. Um, and so they're, they're going to pull apart eventually, pull apart these homologous chromosomes. Um, so, so Again, this tetrad idea happens in um, all, across all chromosomes, that all of them pair up with their homologous chromosome in the tetrad. And then this thing that I'm gonna to talk to you about next called crossing over happens. So crossing over in detail is when non-sister chromatids exchange DNA segments. So again, remember sister, sister, right? These two are sisters, but in a homologous pair, this is the non-sister to this. You wouldn't, if you had, um, if you would go back up here and we think about these non-homologous chromosomes, this one is not homologous to this, right? We wouldn't even say non-sisters because non-sister refers to only to chrom chromatids that are in the homologous pair. 
So non-sister chromatids are going to cross over and this location right here, and this location is called the chiasmata. And the chiasmata is simply defined as the location where crossing over occurs. And then you have these chromatids that used to be non-sisters, and now they get a new name, and the new name is recombinant chromatids. So they're recombinant if they have exchanged DNA material in the crossing over. You would call the ones that, the non-sister chromatids that did not cross over, they're still non-sisters, but they're also non-recombinant. So they, they have two names now, non-sister and non-recombinant. All right, so that's what happens during prophase. Again, prophase one has the tetrad and the crossing over, all that good stuff, the chiasmata. But if we look at metaphase one here, we also notice that something interesting is happening. They stay in their tetrads. Those homologous chromosomes stay in their tetrads. And when the kinetochores are attaching to the microtubules, the spindle fibers, um, those are going to attach in such a way that it's going to allow us to pull apart homologous chromosomes. So one homologous chromosome goes to one pole and another homologous chromosome goes to the opposite pole. And they all line up there on the metaphase plate, just kind of like there was a metaphase plate in mitosis, but the way they line up is different. They line up with their homolog in that tetrad. Hopefully this makes sense to you. We still have like those non-kinetic core microtubules, right? That's still happening here. So the, the cell will, will be able to elongate. That's metaphase one. In anaphase one, what we're having is the separation of homologous chromosomes. Notice that the sister chromatids are still attached to each other. Non-sister chromatids are separating. The, the, um, the recombinant chromatids, those are separating. They're staying um, with each other attached to their centromere. It's the homologous chromosomes that are separating in anaphase one. And telophase one and cytokinesis, we do see this um, nucleus starting to reform. We've got um, each chromosome still has its sister chromatid. We do see like the the spindle apparatus has disappeared. Um, all of those things that happened in telophase of mitosis are happening, but uh, look, we, each of these nuclei has half the number of chromosomes. This nucleus only has one, two, three chromosomes, and so does this one. So these cells that are starting to form here and that'll finish forming when cytokinesis happens, these cells are haploid. Again, just a reminder that in meiosis, uh, cytokinesis, we go through a cleavage furrow with that contractile ring that pinches off those cells. But in plant cells, we form the cell plate using those vesicles. And those vesicles do they actually come from the Golgi apparatus, um, but that, that's neither here nor there. We're just trying to make this cell plate which is the plasma membrane and the um, forming as well as the, um, the cell wall, the new cell wall that's going to form. So we get two new plant cells. The second stage, the second part of meiosis is called meiosis two. And we still have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, but they get the Roman numeral two because it's the second set. Mitosis two is very, very similar to mitosis. If you can remember mitosis, you know everything that's going to happen in meiosis two. The main difference is simply that we are haploid. So, and we, um, the original cells have already divided into two. So we've got to follow both of those cells through the mitosis, the meiosis process, starting with prophase two. There's these four things that are happening. We've got the nuclear envelope dissolving. We have this more spaghetti-like structures condensing into chromatin. We've got the centrosomes moving towards the poles and the spindle fibers forming. And that's happening in both cells. 
in metaphase two, the chromosomes align on the metaphase plate with one sister of each chromosome headed towards one pole and the other towards the other pole. Our kinetochore microtubules are attached to the centrosome and our non-kinetochore microtubules are attached to opposite centrosomes. In anaphase two, we pull apart those uh, sister chromatids by eating away at the kinetochore microtubules and shortening those up. And in the end, we end up with one, two, three, four cells, all of which are not only haploid, but also no longer have their sister chromatids attached. Again, just a closer look at each of those phases with prophase two, um, we're gonna follow both of those cells along and I've already described to you the four things that I keep repeating kind of over and over again with the nucleus, the centrosomes, the spindle fibers, and the DNA condensing. In metaphase two, they're aligned at the metaphase plate. Although one thing you might notice is that because of crossing over that happened back in meiosis one, those two sister chromatids are not genetically identical to each other anymore. And that's okay. That's actually an important part of meiosis. In anaphase two, the sister chromatids are separating and they're moving towards their opposite poles. In telophase two, the nuclei form, the chromosomes unwind into more spaghetti-like structure of chromatin um, and the spindle fibers disappear. Basically, you've got here four cells that are genetically distinct from each other and that are haploid. Um, we want to just very quickly take a closer look at what happens during, um, during prophase one because it is so very interesting and, and get one more term that might help us understand this. So during prophase one, the homologous chromosomes associate along their whole length. Every allele that's located on one chromosome is matched up with the alleles located on the other chromosome. And there's your, um, your centromeres right there. So, um, so what happens is this little zipper attaches the homologous chromosomes to each other little zipper-like structure, and that has the fancy name of synaptonemal complex. I usually just say synapsis happens, but the synaptonemal, synaptonemal complex forms, so we get these proteins holding these, um, these together. And then, of course, once you're in synapsis, and again, another word for that is the tetrad, um, that the the um, DNA is going to be broken. And you can see that breakage happening here. And it's happening at the exact matching point allele for allele. So that when they break and they reform and swap which chromosome they were on, um, you get that crossing over thing happening. All right, so lots and lots of complicated stuff happens in meiosis. And we are going to continue thinking about meiosis doing a really careful compare and contrast here between meiosis and mitosis in the next lecture. And we'll think about some of the implications for sexual reproduction as well.